Ena hoa aloha aina, ena hoa velo like, na hoa aloha Na ahi kana na, na niuhi holo aina Na maka koa me na maka kai eo, o ahua lua E noho ana i kamalua na one o kākuhi hewa Aloha nui kākou Aloha Mahalo nui keia, keia hui ana, keia akua kua nui ana mai o kākou i keia lā uh, I anei nei, mahalo hoi, uh, kou kou, ho ka avale ana I kahi wā e, e hui ai kākou Maluna o keia o kahi me keia nuu kia O ke kū kia i mauna ana me ka mālama ana i ke kapu o mauna kea uh, Maka ho ole ana I ke kūkulu ia o kahi ohe nāna nui hou uh, o TMT uh, Mahalo keia ho oku paa ana, keia uh, ho olo kahi ana, keia ho oku o koa ana uh, O kākoua pau uh, Nani vale pākana au uh, uh, O maka e mino aka ka waha I ka ike ana i keia ano Komo vale ana o ka poe I loko na mea i noo noo ia ma ke kahi ano he hana ia ma ka mauna A laila hele ana i Honolulu a hele ana i Enei a ike ia mana wahi a pau kei a Hapai like ana i, I kei a au kahi me kei a nuu kia me kei a kule ana nui o kākou ka la hui A no na kupuna o ka wāi hala A no na kamali ia me na hanauna a e hiki mai ana a, Piha vale kana au i ka mahalo ka haa heo a me ka uh, ki aloha, ya u koupa kahi a pau, uh, mahalo, mahalo nui. Uh, aloha everybody, um, my name is Kaho Okahi Kanuha, I am from Kona Hawaii, ya u pua a pau lua loa. And um, before we get started, I want to just mahalo everybody for, for taking the time um, out of what I know are our busy schedules to be here. Um, to come and to, to listen, but more so to, to see the, what's happening um, off the Mauna. Uh, I, I hear and I read and I know about the support and how um, things have gone way beyond that, but being up at 6,500 feet and, and being on the Mauna most of the time, we don't always get to experience it and to see it. And to see, just to stand in the back there and to see the aha happen and happen so naturally, so comfortably. Um, to see Keiki and Makua and Kupuna, it's a, it's a trip. Um, and, and I just have so much mahalo for you folks, for everything that you folks have done, for the support that you folks have given uh, to Mauna Kea. I know many of you have probably been to the Mauna. Many of you have probably been to the Mauna multiple times. Um, and I know many of you will probably go to the Mauna again if, and, and for the first time if you haven't. And I just want to mahalo each and every one of you because um, what's happening on Mauna Kea is not a moku keave issue. It's a lahui issue. It's a kanaka issue. And um, I for one know that without each and every one of you, without the support that you folks have given us uh, from Oahu and from all the other mokupuni as well, that the success that we've had up until this point would not be possible. Um, it, it's not going to happen with a few individuals. It's not going to happen with a, with a moku. It's not going to happen with a mokupuni. The only way that it happens is with a lahui. And um, I'm just privileged and honored and grateful to be a part of such a special time in our history and to, to stand here amongst each and every one of you um, together as, as one lahui whether we, we have the, the koko or not, um, I, I just, I, I, I cannot believe um, what's happening <laughs> in, in this, at this time. We had, uh, we had what we thought was a crazy idea three weeks, uh, three months ago to occupy Pu'uhuluhulu um, because we knew that ever since 2015, after we stopped TMT on the Mauna, and after we stopped them, or the, the, um, the petitioners stopped them in the court, we knew that was a win. We knew it was a victory, something to be proud of, and something that would carry us forward. But we also knew that it wasn't something that was permanent, that this, that, that time would come again. We didn't know when. We didn't know how many years we'd have in between. But we, I, I felt very confident, and many of us felt confident, that 
the struggle that we engaged in and that we endured in 2015 was going to be a struggle that we were going to have to do all over again. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, in 2015, one of the things that we could say, and, and there, there was many, but one of the things that we could say to those who didn't support or who wanted to just use the, the rule of law argument was that this issue was not settled. It was still in appeals in the Supreme Court and there was not a final decision to grant the permit. And a lot of people could kind of, um, you know, get that. And they could, they, could, they could base an opinion solely on that. Well, let's, let's let it be settled. And then we'll see. And so, um, I think many of us knew that when we go into that system, that flawed system, very, very rarely does it work in our benefit. And history shows that. Um, but I want to mahalo the, the individuals and the groups who went in there anyway and who, who dedicated their lives um, to that struggle. Because what took place in the courts, in the contested case hearing, in the Supreme Courts, that's just as much of a sacrifice and a struggle as it is to be on Mauna Kea or to be at Pu'uhulu Hulu. And so I want to recognize um, those individuals. But um, in, in 2018, when the Supreme Court, or after the, the contested case hearing was held, and the, the, the judge recommended to the BLNR, the Board of Land and Natural Resources, to go ahead and grant the permit, and then the, the BLNR went ahead and did so, and then it's taken back up to the Supreme Court, and they rule in favor of TMT with only one dissenting opinion. I, I, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to say I, I felt a certain way, but I was, I was nervous that maybe we wouldn't have the same support that we had in 2015. Maybe a lot of people would have put you know, their trust into the system and to the decisions of the powers that be with the idea that, well, they went through due process now. They followed all of the steps and they've granted the permit. So maybe it's time we take a step back. And I was nervous. Um, I think many of us were. There was four years in between, right? And then there was a, there was a big struggle and an, a lot of endurance and a lot of sacrifice that took place during that time. Um, and only to see it come up again. And so as we were getting ready, we, we, we found out in June of this past year, or of this year, that um, they were going to go up with a huge operation and they were going to tear down Halekukia Imauna and they were going to tear down the Ahu. And, and they did. Um, and, and I remember getting a call that night from, um, from Andre Perez, who's on Oahu, and I was in Kona. And um, one of the things that I do is um, I work with Avaya Ulu in, in Hawaiian language. And we meet uh, on the computer twice a week, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And we meet for like four hours. And so um, our meeting was from 7 to 11. And my phone is just blowing up. Andre calling me over and over and over again, which he's kind of used to because I'm not that great at answering my phone. Um, and he's texting me. He's like, bro, you got you to gotta call me now, right now. And so I tell him, boy, I cannot. I'm in a meeting. Uh, I call you when I pow. And around 10.45 or so, we got out and I gave him a call. And he said, you got to go up to the Mauna. And, I, and I, I'm thinking he's pulling my leg. Like he's messing with me. And I know, what do you mean go up to the Mauna? It's 11 o'clock. He said, you got to go up to the Mauna. I, I got word. They're going up and they're going to desecrate the Ahu. They're going to tear down the Hale. And for about five minutes, I was going back and forth with him. I never believed him. And he told me, no, bro, I, I'm serious. I, I've been checking flights. I'm trying to fly out. I can't make it tonight. There's nothing. By the time I get there tomorrow, it'd be too late. I think you need to go. And so I packed up. 12 o'clock, I left my house. I got to Pu'uhulu Hulu at 1.15. Uh, what he told me was that at 3 o'clock, they were supposed to begin an operation. And at 3.05, I saw some... Um, a small, just a small convoy, maybe five or six vehicles, some trucks, make their way up the Mauna. And so I, felt, I, I figured, okay, that's the guys. So I followed them up, went to um, where Hale Kukia I Mauna was, across from the visitor center. There was nobody there. And so kind of went around, checked out Hale Pohaku, saw that there were some vehicles there. They were planning probably 
um, briefing. And then I figured, okay, well, we have people here at Halipuhaku because some other individuals had followed up. And I wanted to go to the top and make sure that um, as best as possible that nothing was going to happen up there. And if it was, to at least be able to document that and to, to show our people exactly what the state of Hawaii thinks about our culture today. Um, and, and in that engagement, um, I was arrested on June 20th for obstruction of government operation. Um, and, and just as a side note, that, that charge was actually just dropped last week, Thursday. It was dismissed. So I can do it all over again now. <laughs> um, but later on that day, I remember getting out of jail and all these different notifications on the phone and that there was a press conference. And they had announced that TMT had the right of way to, to move forward and that they were going to begin construction um, very soon. And so I think from that day, that was June 20th, um, we went to Hulu Hulu on July 12th, so we had about three weeks. So uh, we knew that we had to begin organizing and planning for another prolonged struggle and resistance on Mauna Kea. But the truth is, like I said earlier, we knew that from 2015 it was going to happen again. And so we went around and we, we, we um, went into trainings with different organizational activist groups um, around America and then others in Hawaii and was able to acquire some, some good tools and good knowledge and good strategy and tactics that we felt we would be able to implement in this movement. Uh, because we knew that if as awesome and as great as 2015 was, and I can say I was there, there was very little organization. Everything was organic. And, and there's a beauty to that. And there's a, um, there's, a, there's a pono to that as well. But the truth is, from that day, they weren't just sitting around wondering what they were going to do. They were planning. They were organizing. Right? The crosswalk is not gone just by coincidence. The guardrails haven't, haven't been put in over there just by coincidence. They had a clear intention of eliminating a space that we utilize to hold our ground and to malama mauna kea. And so we wanted to make sure that we were doing the same thing as best as possible within, you know, we're not, that's not our job. We don't sit in the office all day and, and write emails and, and think about those things. But in the, in the little spare time that we had or that we were able to make, we went ahead and, and engaged in these, um, in these trainings. And so once the, the press conference came out that they were going to move ahead, we figured, okay, now it's time to really get everybody together and start planning because we have, who knows, maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a month. But it's right around the corner. And so, um, again, Andre calls me and he says, Bruh, you got to get the people together. You, you got you to gotta make a call here and you got you to gotta tell them, let's, let's go. Let's start organizing. So I reached out to um, a lot of the people who were instrumental and um, who were on Mauna Kea for the, the nonviolent direct action struggle and who had given up their lives and their families and their jobs and their kuleana to engage in that. And I said, you know, come to my house, we'll meet in my garage, and we're going to start figuring something out. And so, I believe on the 20th, they also announced that they were going to close the roads, the Mauna Kea Access Road, for construction. And so another thing that they put in place that was not going to allow us to occupy and take the same space that we took before. So we knew we basically had um, one option, and that was to take Pu'uhulu Hulu. So we, we, we started meeting. I think the first meeting had about eight of us. Um, it was difficult because a lot of our people were in Aotearoa at that time. There was the NISA conference. And so they were there, they were presenting, a lot of them talking about Mauna Kea, but they weren't here. Um, but we didn't have time to wait. And so the ones who were, we got together, we started talking, we met one weekend, um, for about four or five hours in the hot corner heat in my garage. And then after the meeting, we figured we're, we're going to come back again next week and we're going to talk about it again. And the next week, we were actually um, joined by a group of individuals. The, what I think they call themselves the, the Kupuna Council or the Kupuna Ho'oponopono Council. And they were sent to my house from what was expressed to us by the governor. David Ige and 
they were sent to my hale to ask us if we can find a peaceful resolution to this situation. And so I remember sitting, we, we had a, a circle. I think at that halabai we probably had about 12 or 15 of us. And, and they told us how the governor wants to find a peaceful resolution. He doesn't, wanna, he doesn't want 2015 to happen all over again. And so as they're explaining you know, his thoughts and his ideas and his perspectives, my mind flashed back to a mo'olelo of Kamehameha and Kiave Mauhili. And um, in 2016 or so, I got into a little phase of making konane boards. And, and so I, had, I knew that in my garage I had this, this bin with some wood blanks and, um, and some you know, half-made konane boards that weren't finished yet. And I had a, a pile, I had um, some bags of ili'ili ili and ko'a, of the black rocks and the, the white rocks that we use in konane. And so as he's, as they're t telling us what he wants to see, well, and, and he, this peaceful resolution he wants, is he, wants to, he wants to do it in culturally. He wants to find a cultural peaceful resolution because he has so much respect for the Hawaiian culture, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, you want a peaceful resolution? I got an idea. So I walk up, I just get up and I, I leave. And they keep talking. And my house is small, so I can hear everything that's going on. I walk to the... Uh, to the box, I pull out one ili ili, one black rock, I pull out one ko'a, one white rock. I go to the other side of my house, I pull off a la'i, and I put the two pohaku inside and I wrap it up. And I tell them, when, when there, was a, there was the three-way struggle on Hawaii Island between Kamehameha, Kiawe Mauhili, and Keowa, and they were battling back and forth, and um, there was kind of a, a stalemate, not in the sense that they weren't doing anything, but there was nobody who was able to exert their force and their power so much so over the other to take control and to rule. And Ke'el Moku, who's from Maui, is telling Kamehameha, well, let's, let's, go, let's go get Kiawe Mauhili. Let's go take him out. And Kamehameha had a, had a strong relationship with Kiawe Mauhili uh, through Mo'oku Ohau and through other means and didn't feel comfortable going and engaging and attacking in war. And so they come up with this idea that they're going to send a kukini, a messenger, a runner to Hilo, to Waiakea, to deliver a message to Kiawe Mauhili. And so I'm telling them this story. And, and I think one of the individuals, or I know one of the individuals knew this story well. I'm not sure if the other two did. And in this mo'olelo, this kukini takes two pohaku, the black and the white, and he wraps it in kapa. And he takes it to Kiawe Mauhili, and he delivers it. And when Kiawe Mauhili opens it, he kind of starts to cry. Because without any words, he knows exactly what that message is. And in Konane, if you play Konane, you have two color rocks, and you know, you do the whole thing, you put them behind your back, you switch them up, switch them up, and then you got to choose. And the person that chooses the black rock, or who doesn't choose, whoever, has, whoever ends up with the black rock is the person that's going to make the first move, is going to engage. And so when he, when he opens the cup and he sees these two pohaku, he begins to cry because he knows exactly what this means. Kamehameha is asking him if he wants to go to war. He has two choices. He, he gives Kamehameha everything he wants or he fights for it. And so Kiawe Mauhili sends back the white rock. That's the one that he selects. He wants peace. He doesn't want to go to war. And then the Mo'olelo continues. Kamehameha actually sends another runner again because Ke'o Moku is like, no, bro, that wasn't enough. That's not about war. You got you to gotta test them. Go back. Ask for the Anaya of Waiakea. Ask for the Ava of Waiakea. And so the Mo'olelo continues. But what I expressed to them was this idea that there were these two rocks and there was a choice. And so I wrapped the two rocks in La'i and tea leaf to express our commitment to peace. We hope you choose the white rock because we don't want to go to war. You know, as, as important as this is and as, as beautiful of a time this is, you know, I mean, how many, how many of us, you know, hope that, you know, I hope, I hope next year I got to live on Mauna Kea for six months or six weeks and, and, and fight and struggle and leave my family and leave my job and leave my commitments and take the sacrifices and the financial burdens and everything else that comes with it. 
We'll do it if we have to do it. We'll do what's necessary. But I'm not, I, I don't know of anybody, and I could be wrong, but I don't know of anybody who hopes for that. So I told them, take this back and give this to the governor and give him the choice. We can engage and we can go to, you know, quote unquote war, a modern time style, or we can truly find a peaceful resolution like he wishes. But if he wants to do it in a cultural way, then here you go. And so they took it back to him. And we found out later, maybe a few days later, a week later or so, that he refused to open the la'i. So he doesn't even know what's inside. The story was told to him by those individuals, or at least by one of them, about Kamehameha and Kiyabi Mauhili and contextualized it and gave him that same option. But what was told to us is that he refused to open the la'i. And so, a decision was made. We need to engage. And so we began planning under that understanding and we came up with this idea that we're going to take Pu'uhuluhulu and that's going to be our crosswalk. That's going to be our Halekukia Imauna. And we're going to utilize that area because we, we, we knew that if we wanted to, if we hope to have any chance against TMT, we're going to need a place for our people to gather. Right? There's, there's nothing close to Mauna Kea. You got Hilo 20, 25 miles down. You got Kona 30, 35 miles down. You got Waimea another 35 miles the other way. There's nothing around that space. We cannot be living 40 miles away and then expect to be able to have the upper hand and be there before them. They have the means to keep people there all day, all night. We see that. Even if it costs them $10 million through three months, <laughs> they're going to do it. The truth is we don't have $10 million, but the truth is we also don't need $10 million. Because we have Kanaka, we have Aloha Aina, and we have Oya Io. So we started thinking, you know, we, we're going we're gonna to go there, we're going to take it. And so we developed the invitation. Uh, maybe some of you might have gotten it. Not a lot of people did because this was like, you know, like top secret. Uh, we didn't want to. We didn't want to be sharing our plans and, and, and sharing it through avenues and venues that could be infiltrated and where this information could be taken uh, into the wrong hands, and they could get a step ahead of us. So we were utilizing, um, you know, secret means of communication with the idea that on Friday, June twelfth, we're going to meet at Ohai Ula at Spencer Beach Park, and we're going to ask the people to join us at Pu'uhuluhulu to stand in protection of Mauna Kea. And so, between the last meeting uh, on a Sunday and that day on a Friday, you know, as you, as, like anything you do, as you get closer, you start to second guess, you start to question, you start to wonder, who oh, are, we, are we ready? Do, is our plan good enough? Uh, what about this? What about that? What if they think this? What if they say that? What if we do this? All these different scenarios running through our head. And we start to feel like, okay, we need, we need a little bit more. We need, a, we need more than just go to Pu'uhuluhulu and occupy that area. And, and from 2015, you can see it with the building of the Hale, you can see it with the building of the Ahu, you can see it with the, um, the, the Lole that people wear, the, the utilization of Hawaiian language, of Oli, of Pule, that we want and we need our resistance to be rooted in our identity and our culture. We have a lot of examples throughout the world that we can look to, to follow and as examples, and we use them, and they give us guidance. But we also need to have our own movement. We don't want to just copy Martin Luther King. We don't want to just copy Gandhi. We can utilize principles and philosophies and ideas and tactics and, and strategies from them, but it has to be grounded in our culture, especially if the governor and the state of Hawaii respects Hawaiian culture like they say. And so, I think it was um, Wednesday night, Kalekoa and Andre are the first two to come to Hawaii Island. They stay at my house and we start together. We get all paranoid and we start asking all these questions. We need more. And in 2015, as we kind of reached a stalemate, because 2015 was Occupy end of March, police engagement, I think it was April uh, or March 28th or 29th. They came up, we held them off at the crosswalk for eight hours. 
from 7 to 3.30, they turned around, went back home, no arrests. Victory number one. A, a, about a week later, April 2nd, they come up again, and that's where the 31 Kanaka, the 31 Aloha Aina are arrested. I think it's 12 down at the crosswalk, and then another 17 uh, or 14 or whatever the number was up at um, the proposed site. And we're able to hold them off that day. They might have gotten to the machines for a short period of time, but no more than half an hour. They had to go back down because of the amount of time it took them. And then we had a, a long, about a two month, two and a half month stalemate where nothing was happening. And they came back up again on June 24th. And that's the day that we had all the different lines up on the Mauna. We had the crosswalk again with the Kupuna. And from 7 or 6 o'clock in the morning, whatever time it was that they got there, until about 1 o'clock that afternoon, they made it a grand total of one mile past the crosswalk. And they made the decision that it wasn't going to work. And they turned around and they went back home. And that was the last of it. We remained there for about another month or, or, month or so. And then we, we went into a time of Ho'omalu. Yeah, to reorganize, re-strategize, re-energize, and do all that good stuff. And then in November, we get the kahea that um, they're going to go up one more time. They're going to try. And I think it was the night before they were supposed to go up that there was an injunction um, that, was, that was put in, not allowing that to happen. And then shortly after that, there was a decision that came down from the Supreme Court ruling that permit invalid. And now TMT didn't have, didn't have the so-called legal right to proceed. And they had to move towards getting the machines off the Mauna. And so we expected that this thing would be similar, that it would be a prolonged one. I, for one, didn't think that we'd have down times like this. I thought it'd be very different from 2015. I thought that they would push forward one day, get pushed back, come back the next day, get pushed back and, and keep coming and keep coming until they got through. And so far, that hasn't been the case. But we needed to be prepared for that. And we still have to be prepared for that because it still could, very well could happen. And so, as we're talking about these things, they come in Wednesday night. We're going to Costco. <laughs> super uh, conspicuous. Looking, buying, all, buying tents and buying lanterns and buying all, all kinds of stuff. And the three of us together, yeah? So, um, our, our cover was blown. But that night we're talking about it. And, and like I was saying, in, in 2015, during that time, as we were in between those, those days of, in, of police engagement, we started talking about the idea of creating a pu'u honua there that would give us more of a cultural right to be there and more cultural protection. And so we were brainstorming, but we never, we never ever got to that point. Um, and, and things were very different back then. A lot of times in 2015, there was eight, 12 of us on the mountain at a time. I mean, other than the nights before arrest, I think the most people we had staying on Mauna Kea was maybe 40 or 60 people. So we didn't have the numbers like we do now to do those types of things. So it never happened. But as we're brainstorming and kind of getting all paranoid and freaking out, we fell back to that idea. I said, what if we, what if we make Pu'u Hulu Hulu a Pu'u Honua? A safe place, a refuge, a sanctuary, a safe haven for our kanaka, where we could gather, where we can, you know, find safety and shelter, have food, have water, and be able to sustain, hopefully, what, what we hope will become a very large and mass movement. And so we figure, okay, well, who, who has kuleana to that aina? Who has the most kuleana to that aina? And there's an ahu there at Pu'u Hulu Hulu. Many of you have probably seen it and many of you have probably been to it. And that ahu was built in 1999 and it's malamad by um, the Royal Order of Kamehameha. And so we figured, okay, what if we reach out to the Royal Order of Kamehameha? And I tell them, I was like, whoa, I get the kind, I get the Kalaimoku's number. Like, we call him. Like, yeah, call him. So we call him Thursday night, about 6 o'clock or so. And um, I talked to uh, the Kalaimoku. And I asked him, Uncle, I got to talk to you. We can, uh, we, we can talk story. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. What's up? What's up? 
I'm like, oh, but not on the phone. I, I like talk to you in person. He's like, oh yeah, anytime. What you doing tomorrow? I'm like, no, not tomorrow. I gotta talk to you tonight. <laughs> He's like, oh, just kind of caught off guard a little bit. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, can. I said, okay. Um, we gotta run some errands. We gotta go to the airport, pick some stuff up, and then we'll come by. He said, okay, come by. So. Things take much longer than we thought. We're waiting for certain things to come in. They don't come in. We got to wait. By the time we're ready to leave the airport, it's 10.30 at night. And so I call him. Uncle, <laughs> what? Still can come over? He's like, yeah, 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 come. We're waiting. We're waiting. So we get to his house almost 11 o'clock at night. And we tell him our idea. We want to create a pu'uhonua. We explain all the reasons why, um, what we think this thing would fulfill, and what it would provide for our people, and how it would help us in our struggle to protect Mauna Kea. And right off the bat, he's on board. He's all supportive. He's like, oh yeah, this is a, this is a great idea. I just got to run this by the Ali'i Nui. And, but, but I'm pretty sure he can, I mean, I know he can, he can say, yeah. But we just got to run it by him. And then, and so we're thinking, okay, but you're probably not going to do that tonight. You know, and <laughs> sorry, but we need an answer tonight. Like, we got to know. Otherwise, we got to change things up. And so we kind of, try one more time, we explain to him one more time and start, you know, just kind of, um, not trying to convince him, but just trying to so, show some urgency. And then about half hour later, he just slams his hand on the table. He says, you know what? I'm the Kalai Moku. I can make the decision. Yeah. We're going to do it. Yeah. And so it was on. So we left his house. Uh, maybe yeah. half hour after midnight, maybe one o'clock. We went home with the idea, okay, tomorrow we're going to Ohai Ula and we're going to tell the people we're going to make a pu'uhonua. And so we get to Ohai Ula and we get there shortly before the time to meet. I think the time to meet was 6 o'clock, right around sun, uh, sunset. Or a little bit before sunset at that time because we're in summer. And um, I, remember sh I remember rolling in and just seeing a bunch of people there already. And I was thinking, oh, wow. We didn't, we didn't know how much people we were going to have because we didn't put this on social media. We, we couldn't just send out mass text messages. Um, everything was being done either through um, an encrypted text messaging and, and calling system or by word of mouth. And the kahe only went out about four days before, um, before that meeting. Because the original idea actually was to go on Sunday the day before we expected them to, to engage. We had received word that police were going to arrive on July 15th on Monday and they were going to begin the operation on July 17th. So we knew we had to be there before them. Um, we also knew that they were watching that area because we were checking it out. We were spending nights in Pu'uhuluhulu and they had security. And they would come in um, around sunset time and they would stay to about 6 o'clock in the morning, go home, come back at night, stay, go home. And so we saw all of those things and we knew that they were watching it. So we figured, okay, now we, we, Sunday's too late. We got to go, go a little bit earlier. So that's where the meeting came for Friday. We're showing up and, and choked people there. And little by little, more and more came, more and more came. And they started to come into the pavilion and fill it up. And we probably had about maybe this amount of people. Maybe, um, actually, no, not this much. We had about 200 or so. And, and our hope was that Okay, that's right around the number we were thinking. It was like, if we can get 200 people to go to Pu'uhuluhulu, maybe we get a chance. Maybe we can hold them off. Maybe even just a couple days, but maybe we can hold them off. And so, we explain the, you know, the, the so-called idea that we have and asking them to, you know, if, if, they, if they agree with it, if they can join in and support. Oh, oh here we go. Okay. So we have about 200 people, and we're thinking, if we can get 200, we can, we can hold them off. So we explain everything, and at the end of the halavai, we ask everybody, okay, if, if you're ready to go tonight, raise your hand. And about 20 hands went up. And for about 5 or 10 seconds, we had this horrible feeling of, um, of nervousness and doubt. Like, ooh, 20 people, I'm not, I'm not sure we can do that. And, but then we figured out, oh, yeah, nah. We only had a little bit in 2015. You just got to start somewhere and people will come. And if not, then at least the record will reflect that we were there, we put up resistance, and at least the history books and our, and our future generations will know that we tried. 
And so, uh, Kalei Kua stood up and he gave one of his inspirational speeches trying to get people activated. We took a, a roll call one more time and we had about 30 people. So, when we left Ohai Ula that night around 10 o'clock, we went with 13 vehicles and 33 people to Pu'uhuluhulu. The next day, uh, we, we stayed up pretty much throughout the night, took a short nap. Four o'clock, we were up again. We expected that the, the police would, would roll up and, and try to remove us, but they didn't. By, by sunrise, we had about 50 people. We had a light sunrise ceremony at the Ahu with the idea that at around 12 o'clock, around noon, ke kaukalai kalolo, we were going to go ahead and establish the Pu'uhonua. And so, by 12 o'clock, we had maybe closer to 100 people. Lanakila was there. We explained to Lanakila what we wanted to do. Lanakila immediately went ahead and walked the whole area. He came back about an hour later. He said, I get them. I, I, get, I get the boundaries. Okay. So we had Ohe that we had asked some, um, some hoa to, to give to us. They brought it to Ohe Ula. We took it up. And we had, we had um, these kappa-like materials. And we, we cut the ohe, we cut them all at equal lengths, and we wrapped them with the black and white um, kappa thing, kappa-like thing. And the reason why we chose black and white was to reflect the option and the choice that we gave to the governor about peace and to kind of commemorate that. And so that day, we, um, within our group, we had a lot of people who weren't from Hawaii Island. They had come from off island, they had answered the kahea, and so we found, we found people from every different Mokupuni to, to Kokua in erecting certain lepa. So no Mokupuni was left out of the erecting of the, of the different lepa lepa, the different boundary markers around the Pu'uhonua. And we, we entered into about a, a two hour long ceremony. We started at the, at the entrance to Pu'uhuluhulu. We made our way down towards the Hilo side all the way to the, um, the Mauna Loa access road. Went back to the Pu'u back over past the ahu, back out to the highway, and then back to the center. It took us about two hours, and Lanakila led us in ceremony and protocol, uh, consecrating each and every lepa lepa that was put up by different people from different Mokupuni. And the reason why we did that again is because we knew that if we wanted to have any chance of beating these people, we're going to need all of our Mokupuni to come together. And this was going to be a place for all of our people. Not just the guys from Kona and Waimea and Hilo and Ka'u and all these different areas in Hawaii, but all of our people. We needed them to come. And obviously, they came. Yeah? And so, um, the rest of it is, you know, is, it's there, it, it's documented. We know Monday they came up. There was the cattle guard, eight Aloha Aina, locking themselves down from 3 o'clock in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon. They were put under arrest at about 3.30, 4 o'clock. They were put under unarrest at 3.30 in the afternoon and they lied there on that cold and uncomfortable uh, cattle guard for 12 hours. The Kupuna line formed down at the bottom of the road. And I remember in, my, in our meetings at my, in my garage, Auntie Maxine Kahaule Leo, um, she told me, <laughs> she's like, Kanuha, you not getting arrested. You got arrested enough already. We going to get arrested. The kupuna going to get arrested. And I told her, auntie, I thought, oh, auntie I, I'm not going to tell you no. Um, that's what you guys want to do. That's all you. Let's do it. You know, I, I'm definitely not going to ask you to do that because my teachings tell me that we should be trying to malama our kupuna. But my teachings also tell me that we should listen to our kupuna. So in my best interest, <laughs> I'm going to let you go. I uh, said, so, you know, if you can find some other people to join in with you, then I think that'd be a very, very strong image. I think it'd be a strong tactic. And I think it would activate um, a lot of people. And so, go for it. And there was no organization around that. That was, you know, we're going to find kupuna. And so Monday, they get that kupuna line. And we have the images of them sitting in their chairs with their beanies and their blankets and their sleeping bags and their gloves and all the kako'o behind them singing all the mele aloha aina. And we were able to hold them off that day. A long struggle. We were, we were up. We were, on the, we were ready at 3 o'clock in the morning. And they didn't pack it up to about 3, 30, 4 o'clock. The next day was a day of negotiations, trying to gain certain um, 
advantages and certain positions in the struggle. All of those things were shot down by the state with the idea that tomorrow we engage again. And that's when, by that time, now we had about 40, 50 kupuna. And they created, and they, from that day one, they never left that road. They created that blockade, and they moved it back, and they've been there ever since then, for now, now 94, 95 days. And as they were arrested one by one, it was a turning point in the movement. Now, everybody knew. And so from that time, there's been, there's been no attempt by the state to move at Mauna Kea. And so, now, what we're, in, what we're engaging in, and, and the reason for it, and, and it could differ for different people, but at the root of it, is that we demand to be recognized and respected as a real people, as a living people. We're not just people and tools and artifacts and clothing that exist in Bishop Museum, but we're real. We continue to live. And I might, look, I might look different from my kupuna, and you might look different from your kupuna, but we are our kupuna. We are not just the product of them, but we are the culmination of all of the great people who have come before us. And if there are great people before us, then there are great people now, and there will be great people in the future. And we demand that we be respected and recognized as such. And so, what we're, what, we're, what we're trying to say is that our language, our history, our culture, our religion, and our spirituality is just as real, just as valid, and just as alive as any other one in the world, whether you recognize it or not. But we will not stand down and we will not give up until you do. And so, you know, we live in a system where we, we believe and, and maybe we've even been tricked into thinking that power is at the top, that power is in the state capital, power is in legislature. But we also have teachings from our kupuna that tell us The chief is the chief because of the people And only because of the people We can look at Ka'u, there were, there were chiefs that never last too long We can look at Hakau during the time of Umi who never last too long Because the people refuse to recognize that type of leader as a leader As someone who can have power So power is is allowed. We allow people to be in positions of power. Their power relies on our obedience, on us obeying them and recognizing them as that. But I don't recognize that structure and that system as the power to determine for Kanaka and for Hawaii our future and our destiny and especially how our sacred land should be protected. That's our kuleana. Oh. And we can look back to the time of the overthrow, shortly after. In 1897, in a time where only 40,000 Hawaiians were alive and we were able to garner over 37,000 signatures protesting the illegal annexation of Hawaii to America. And they did this without Facebook, without Change.com, without Instagram, without share buttons and likes, without emails, without telephones, without vehicles. It was for real. And the people engaged and the people committed and they stopped that treaty. But James Kaulia, and we, we know James Kaulia as the guy who says, until the very last aloha aina, yeah, ahiki ki aloha aina hope loa. But he gave a, a pretty, you know, not a super long speech, but a lengthy speech. He didn't just say, you know, protest forever the illegal annexation of Hawaii to America until the very last aloha aina. That was the ending of his speech. In the beginning, he mentions, you know, um, that we're talking about a, a, a nino, a question that has been very familiar to us over the last four years, because they're in 1897, 1893 is the overthrow. And he says to the people, that the essence, the living spirit of that question, which would be the answer, is within the palm of the hands of the people to whom the land belongs. 
They can be taking the treaty to America. They can be taking it to Congress. We can be talking about those folks in the Republic and the, um, and the United States of America. But no matter what, the power, the spirit of that question is in our hands. And I think that that quote is appropriate for this time. Because many people think, well, it's up to the Supreme Court. It's up to the governor. Well, if maybe if, if, if TMT says they won't build it on Mauna Kea, then, then so be it. But I, for one, am not going to allow China, Japan, India, Canada, and America to tell me and to tell us what happens on our Mauna. That's our decision. That's our kuleana. And so we need to remember, no matter what systems are in place, that power is in the palm of our hands. And we're seeing the truth of that today. Because if we did not engage, if we did not sacrifice, if we did not take that pu'uhonua, TMT would be 90 days into desecration. Pieces, our, pieces of our mauna would be gone forever. And we can look back to the, the pictures that come from the building of the Subaru telescope. And you can see 40 feet of that mauna missing. And I tell people, it's not, like they, they, it's not a piece of, you know, they cut them off and they took them to the storage and they get them waiting in Hawaii self-storage. And they're going to bring it back out in 40 years and Velcro that bugger back onto the land. It's gone forever. And if we don't do anything, then another piece of our aina is going to be gone forever. Another piece of our kupuna is going to be gone forever. Another piece of our history is going to be gone forever. Another piece of our mo'oku ho is going to be gone forever. Another piece of us is going to be gone forever. Because Navahi says, I think it was 1895, And he answers, And he answers, who is your mother? It is Aina. Who is your grandmother? It is Aina. So, we do the equation and who are we? We are Aina. If there's no Pono for Aina, there's no Pono for Kanaka. To damage Aina is to damage Kanaka. And so, we need to, the only, the only option we have is to stand together. And my, my friend and mentor, Kalei Koa, he always says, the greatest fear of the state of Hawaii is a unified and educated Hawaiian people. And that's what we're seeing happening right now. We're becoming unified more and more every day. We're becoming educated more and more every day. And, and when we look at, you know, whatever it is that, that we have as, you know, rights as Hawaiians or benefits or progress that we've made, that's not the result and the product of a, of a certain governor taking office and thinking, I'm going to do good by the Hawaiians. Out of the goodness of my heart, I'm going to give them back a ho'olave because I'm, because I'm such a good person and I care so much for them, I'm going to legalize Hawaiian language again in the schools. That wasn't them that did it. No matter what policy and what resolution and what legislation we look at, those things happen through struggle. Those things happen through sacrifice. And those things happen through Kanaka taking a stand, going to the powers that be. And when they told them no, we did it anyway. And when they said no again, we kept doing it. And what they did, or what we have now, are the results of that. Kaho Olave, Olelo Hawaii, Ivi Kupuna. We can go down the list of all the different struggles. Kaho Olave wasn't returned because we had, you know, nice legislators. Not to say there weren't any in there, but even their power is limited. Real power is in community. Real power is in standing together. And so, when we look at our mo'olelo, and I posed the question in the beginning of the movement, 
to our Lahui. What kind of kupuna will we be? And for some of us, we are, we are at that age of being a kupuna. But I'm not looking at just age. What kind of kupuna will we be? Because if George Helm was just looking at age, then we wouldn't talk about him. Because he was 26, 27 years old when he got killed. He didn't wait till he was 60 or 70 to have a legacy. We were all born kupuna. We will have those who come after us. And I know that I, I, I come from, in my opinion, <laughs> the greatest people to ever walk this earth. And I'm not saying that there aren't other great people and that other Lahui and other nationalities aren't great. But I know mine is good enough. I don't need to attach myself and Ho'opili Mea'ai anywhere else. My kupuna are the greatest kupuna I could have. And there's never a day where I don't, I'm not proud to be who I am. Not because of who I am, but because of who my kupuna were. And who my kupuna make me and make us. But I know that we didn't get here through smooth sailing. I wasn't alive 2,000 years ago when they jumped on that va'a and they went holo from Kahiki and came to Hawaii. But I know it wasn't easy. There may have been a lot of doubt. Never been to Hawaii before. But they took that risk. They made that sacrifice. They jumped on that va'a and they came to Hawaii and they created a great civilization like nowhere else in the world. Clean, productive, sustainable. I know that during the times of Kamehameha, when he goes to Maui and he invades them and he gets in front of his people and he says, Imua e ki'i, a inui kawai ava ava, a ahe hope e hoia e ai. He wasn't talking about drinking lemonade. He wasn't talking about drinking fresh water. It wasn't iced tea and pog juice. The vai ava ava, the bitter waters, the bitter waters. Because it wasn't easy. Because it wasn't fun. Because in many ways it wasn't something that they wanted to do. But they felt that through this they could end it. They could unify the people and we could become one and we wouldn't need all these different kingdoms battling and warring against each other. And when I look at that, I think they did that not just for themselves, but again, for the future. But many people died in that war. Many people. Or kupuna. No matter what island we come from, or what island we live on, we have kupuna who gave their lives and lost them. We can jump ahead to Timoteo Ha'alilio who in 1842 left Hawaii and sailed across the world in an attempt to establish and, get our, and uh, have our independence recognized. And on November 28, 1843, Hawaii is recognized as an independent country by France and Great Britain through the signing of the Anglo-Franco Proclamation. But he didn't jump on airplanes, sit in first class and head over there. He got on a ship, he went to Mexico. He got to Mexico, he jumped on a mule. And he trekked it all the way across to D.C. And we see in the newspapers, among other areas and other places, letters and words from Timoteo that talk about the struggle. And he's sending it back saying, you know what, I'm, I'm doing okay. It's hard. The days are hot. The nights are cold. We got to go through the rivers of Mexico. We got to go through the forests and the highest points of the mountains. We got to suffer through starvation and thirst. But we will not give up. And Timotel gave his life for his Lahui. We can talk about kingdom. We can talk about Ku'oko'a because Timotel gave his life for it. And I don't think for one second that he died by surprise. I don't think for one second that he never knew that that was a risk that he was taking. But he knew that he had a kuleana to his lahui, to his kupuna, to his mo'opuna, 
to goal. He struggled through it, he endured, and unfortunately, he never made it back home to Hawaii. But he went anyway. We can move ahead even to the time of the overthrow. We can grab Nabahi as an example. He resisted, he engaged, and he was thrown in jail. And in jail, he got sick, tuberculosis, and he died, fighting for his Lahui, gave his life for his people. We can talk about the struggle that Lili'u endured, getting imprisoned in her own palace, being shamed, ridiculed, and all the evil, vile things that people were saying about her. And she kept her course. We can jump ahead to more modern times to a popular story that we know with Kaho Olave. Do I think for one second that Georgetown folks didn't know what they were getting themselves into? Didn't know what they were risking? Not at all. I believe they knew very well what was at risk. And they also knew very well what there was to gain. And, and I actually, I'm Ohana with the, the helms on Moloka'i. And I was just there this past weekend, sitting with a few of his nephews, the sons of George Helm's sisters, a sister. And they remember, they remember that time, they were little boys. They remember sitting on his shoulders during that time as the family was asking him not to go back. Enough already. We don't want to lose you. And it was tense times, it was uncomfortable. And, and, and again, I wasn't there. These are the stories that are being told to me. And he went. And he went for the last time. I don't believe for one second he was lost at sea. You can see Kaho Olave very clearly from Moloka'i and Maui. People paddle across that channel in hours, easy. He was killed. But again, not something that I don't believe for one second he wasn't willing to sacrifice. He gave himself for his people, for his aina. And because of that sacrifice and that commitment, not only by him, but by the many others who occupied that island, put themselves in danger of the life bombing. That's for real. That's not just aloha aina, that's aloha aina oya i'o. There's a true commitment in that. Through thick and thin, easy, hard, whatever it is, commitment. And we can find many other examples. By no means is that all. We can find many other, many others. And many of them probably are not, not public knowledge, not common. We have those own examples in our own ohana. Our moms, our dads, our grandmas, our grandpas, our aunties who sacrifice everything for their family. But when I look back to examples like that, how could I ever be ashamed to come from those people? How could I ever not want to be like them? Because of people like that and the many others, we have, again in my opinion, as great of a history, as great of a mo'olelo, as any other nation in this world. And Poi Poi even talks about it, I think it's in 1906, in the newspapers, Joseph Moku'ohai Poi Poi. He talks about, you know, the, how the world looks to Greece and Rome as the standard of poetry and of history and of stories. He says, but we have our own. We have our own stories. We have our own history. We have our own culture. We have our own heroes. And ours are not only just as good as theirs, but ours are even better. And for a point in time, I think we as a people have forgotten that. 
and maybe not so much forgotten, but it's been erased from our memory. Institutionalized denationalization in Hawaii. There was a master plan put in place over a hundred years ago to destroy Kanaka. Might not be like other plans in history where they physically kill us off, but no need when you can mentally kill us off. You can culturally kill us off. When you can erase and wipe away our identity. And I've read enough, I got much more to read, but I've read enough to understand that they, they laid it out clearly. They were going to wipe us out. So what's happening today, according to that master plan, is not supposed to be happening. We're supposed to be gone. Our language is supposed to be dead. Our culture is supposed to be dead. Our history is supposed to be forgotten forever. But again, whether there are those whose story we tell or those who we don't, they held on. They held on enough for us to have an opportunity. And so did they do those things in vain? Or did they do it so that we would carry on? And that we would continue? And that we would ho'omau and ho'omanava nui? And leave just as great of a mo'olelo for our keiki and our mo'opuna that they left for us. And we're in the same mo'olelo. We're not trying to write new stories. The mo'olelo we live and the mo'olelo we create is the same mo'olelo they lived and the same mo'olelo they created. We're just writing new chapters and new pages. And it's our kuleana to ensure that our mo'olelo does not end with us. That we can provide a pathway. We can provide a means for our future to continue on. To be just as great as their kupuna were. And my biggest fear as an individual as someone, you know, who, who uh, I'm, a, I'm a makua now, I'm a father. So I'm going to have mo'opuna and great mo'opuna and great, great mo'opuna. One of my biggest fears is that when they look for inspiration, when they look for guidance, when they look for answers, they got to skip me. And they got to go back to Lili'u. Or they got to go back to Timotel, or Navahi, or Kamehameha, or anybody of the past. And not, I'm not saying at all that we should forget them. Because we need to remember, we need to continue those stories on forever. But I hope, and not I hope, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that if they want to look back to this time, they can find that same inspiration. They can find that same guidance. They can find those same answers. Because the truth is, when we beat TMT, we're going to beat them. When we beat TMT, when we pack their bags and we send them, well, we kind of send them home because they're no more home. <laughs> they're looking for one. But when we send them away, it's not over. We got a whole list, a whole menu of issues that we got to attack. If, if, if issues were food, we're in the biggest buffet we ever seen. Whether you like spaghetti, hamburger steak, sai min, eggs and rice, whatever the case may be, your choices are there. So whatever you connect to, there's always going to be something to fight for. There's always going to be something to struggle against until we reclaim our rightful place as the Kanaka of this Aina. But it's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that happens in 95 days. And I'd be willing to bet it's not something that happens in one generation. It's generational. Right? And it's not starting with us, and it's definitely not going to end with us. But we're going to have to hold Omu'a, we're going to have to hold Omu'a. But when we beat TMT, we will realize, not fully, 
but enough. Aya ka uhane ola o nani nau iloko ka paolima o kalahui no naka aina. The power, the questions, the, the answers to all of these questions, to all of these issues, is in the palm of our hands. So, I want to mahalo each and every one of you, sincerely, honestly, because this doesn't happen alone. It doesn't happen with one person. It doesn't happen with a group of individuals. It doesn't happen with a hui. It doesn't happen with an institution. This only happens with our law hui coming together. And everybody, whether you're on that mauna every day, you're on that mauna once a week, once a month, you can only make it once, you never make them yet, but you're planning to go, no matter what the case may be, everybody sacrifices. We're all a part of the struggle. And every single person has a kuleana. Every single person has a kuleana. And our kuleana might be different. Some might be more visible. But there's no difference in the importance of that kuleana. And of all of, all of our kanaka. So I mahalo every, each and every one of you. For being a part of this. For being a part of this monumental time in our history. A time that will never be forgotten. Because without whatever that sacrifice is, you're contributing to our success. You're contributing, you're contributing to our lanakila, to our liberation as a people. And we need each and every one of you, no matter how it, whatever it, how it is that you engage and you contribute. So if at ever at any point in time you feel like you're not doing enough, I wish I could do more. The truth is we all do. But we're going to do what we can do. And everybody's situation is different. There's a lot of people who provide me the support that allows me to do what we're doing. And that's the same case for many other individuals. And so if you're not on that mauna because you're taking care of the hale, or you're taking care of the bills, or you're taking care of the kids and the food, the mala, the community engagements, whatever it is, that allows others to be there. If you can only come one time, you're not willing to get arrested. You only want to stand on the side of the road. We need you there. It's not just people getting arrested. Someone got a bail amount, right? But when you go to the Mauna, the police don't know us. I mean, you know, kind of know us a little bit, but they don't know exactly what your intention is. They don't know who's going to get arrested and who's not going to get arrested. They say 3,000 people, they see 3,000 people. That could potentially be, in their minds, 3,000 arrests. They see 5,000 people, it's 5,000 people. They kind of go ahead and guesstimate, oh, nah, I think only 300 of them are going to get arrested. They got to account for each and every one of us. And I know, without a doubt in my mind, if the people who marched on this island the other week, the 20,000 plus, if we take that mauna, they have no chance. No chance. We will blow their doors. And I also mahalo each and every one of you for committing to Kapu Aloha. I know there's been questions about it in the past, how effective it is, well it's too passive, it's not going to work. I got 95 days to show you, it works, it works. And we know that it takes all of us to keep that commitment. To gain recognition, to, to become respected, to become effective, recognized, and become credible as a people, it might take 40,000 of us. It might take 400,000 of us. It might take whatever the number is. But they're not on our team. 
It only takes one of us to risk it all. And so for us holding that in tense situations, when we see our kupuna getting arrested, that's not easy. Where else in the world are you going to find a people sit on the side of the road quietly, reverently, respectfully, as their kupuna get taken away? And it's not because we don't care. I, I can tell you it was hard. But our kupuna said, that's what we need to do. And so we did it. And we respect the sacrifice of each individual. Who am I to jeopardize that sacrifice and that risk? Because I want to get loud. Because I want to say something. They make the sacrifice, they make the cause, we respect that. And so I guess to, um, to wrap it up, I had one more thought I wanted to say. I'm trying to think, I cannot remember now. I wonder, many of us probably wonder what it would have been like to be alive a thousand, two thousand years ago and to jump on a va'a and to come here to Hawaii and to sail across the largest and greatest ocean in the world to the most isolated place. Many of us may wonder what it would have been like to be alive during the time of, of Umi to be in the time of Kamalala Valu, to be alive during the time of Kakuhi Heva, Manokalani Po, to be alive during the time of Kamehameha. Many of us may wonder what it would have been like to be alive 25 years after the traditional system of life in Hawaii and to become recognized as the first non-European uh, sovereign and independent country in the world. Many of us may wonder what it would have been like to be alive during the time of Lili Uokalani and the suffrage that she went through and to lose our kingdom and our country. And for those of us who are, who are younger like myself, we may wonder what it was like to be alive in a time where we could legalize again Olelo Hawai'i and allow our keiki to be educated in their own language, in their own culture. I wonder what, it's like, I wonder what it would have been like to be alive during the time of Kaho Olave. We have many great times in our history that maybe we would have liked to have seen. What would it have been like to be alive when everybody spoke Hawaiian? Everybody. I wonder what it would have been like to be alive when Kuka Ilimoku sent his tongue down and wrapped up that Mohai. And just as we may have questions about those times, I believe that our future generations are going to ask themselves those same questions. But they're also going to ask themselves, I wonder what it was like to be alive during Kukia Imauna. And I hope that we can answer those questions for them. That I don't have to direct them to Google. Or go, oh, go get, check the kind, check brother's Facebook. I was there. I didn't just witness it. I didn't just read about it. I didn't just hear about it and I didn't just talk about it. I was there. And I can tell you what it was like. And I can show you what it was like. Because as much as we're able to know about our, our mo'olelo and our kupuna today, many of that we had to find on our own. 
because of the system put in place to erase all of that. A lot of the Mu'allal, in fact, probably all the Mu'allal I know, I had to read about. But I don't want my KK and my Mu'opuna to have to do the same thing. I like them read. I like them read good. I like them read a lot. Can't tell them everything. But I want to be able to tell them and show them what it was like to be a part of our history. So, I don't think anybody here is, but I know maybe there's people watching on camera, maybe who are sitting on the fence who aren't sure. Don't be left out of this time of our history. Don't be left out of this portion of our Mo'olelo that's going to go down with all the other great portions of our Mo'olelo that we have. And if you are on the fence, if you're not sure, <laughs> if you're not sure, go to the Mauna. Just go to the Mauna. Spend three hours there. Spend four hours there. Spend the night. Spend the week, whatever it is. Go to the Mauna. Because I see people who are up there now in 2019 that I would have never in my wildest dreams expected to be there. Never. Many of those people have told me. They don't, they, you know, it's, I support science, I support TMT. And I'm not saying I don't. I just support Kanaka and Aina more. So go to the Mauna. Because there's certain things that we can talk about, there's certain things that we cannot. There's certain feelings that we cannot express with words. You just gotta feel it. So go to the Mauna and witness for perhaps the first time in at least 50 years, maybe even closer to 100, where Hawaiians are comfortable and proud to be Hawaiians. When was the last time we saw AHA taking place in the middle of a parking lot? When was the last time we saw biker groups coming up with their jackets and getting in the middle of the road and dancing hula? When was the last time we saw Kupuna take a stand like this and sacrifice and endure the elements, the wind, the cold, the rain, the heat? For all this time, I talked to kids at my school that I was teaching at before this year. I said, how's it going? Oh, oh, kumu, wame kai, wame kai. Oh, kei ala, make ka ohua, hi meni ana makua pao ya, ai kumu mu. They're telling me, yeah, yeah, you know, on the bus today, everybody was doing ai kumu mu. You know, most times they're playing all that popolo music, yeah? The bump, 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 boom, 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 all that kind of stuff. But they think it's cool to be Hawaiian. And we don't want Hawaiian just to be a fad and a phase and something cool, but hey, what's wrong with starting there? Our kiki can gravitate towards it. And so again to quote Kalekoa, if this is the best they got, we already got them beat. Because we're only going to get stronger. We're only going to get more educated. We're only going to get more informed. We're only going to get more unified. We're only going to get more committed. We're only going to get better. And I know 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, I'm going to be kind of embarrassed. I'm going to look at the leaders of that time. And I'm going to be wishing, man, I wish I could be like them. Because they're going to be so much better than us. But let's help them become that. So just the last one on. If you have kids, put them in Hawaiian schools. Put them in Hawaiian schools. Many of us cannot provide the things that we want to provide for them because they've been taken away from us. But there are some who can. And right now the best option we have is schools. Put them in Punanaleo. Put them in Kulakaya Puni. Send them to Navahi and Kamakau 
And if you graduated and you want to know and you wish, go to community college. Don't be afraid. Go. And if you like, just go to Pu'uhulu Hulu University. No more homework. No more tests. You just be there and take what you can. But Kaulia in 1897 said, in that same speech, what holds up their power is just their force. The fact that they got the police, they got the weapons, they got the courts, they got the handcuffs, they got the policies, they got the capital, they got all that. But the time will come where the power of their weapons will fall. Oh. Due to the sharpness of the brains that have been trained in our own Hawaiian schools. Hawaiian immersion, Punana Leo, they weren't back, they weren't there back then in 1897. But if Kaulia was alive today and he said that, I have no doubt he'd be talking about that. Send your kids to Hawaiian schools. Allow them the opportunity to learn their language, learn their culture, and do aikamumu on the bus. <laughs> and then as best as we can, we nurture it. I was sent to a Hawaiian language school. My parents don't speak Hawaiian. But now I do. And my nine-month-old son will, and his keiki will. And within a few generations, we'll become a family of Hawaiian language. So it's a long and gradual process. Again, it doesn't happen overnight, it's generational. But just like they say about the trees, the best time to plant them was yesterday. But if we miss yesterday, then the next best time is today. So ehana kako, put them in, support them however we can, because the ones who are going to win this battle, this long battle, this long war, I hope it's us. But at the same time, I'm not naive. The goals, the wishes, the things I want to see in my lifetime might not happen. But that gives me no reason to not start and to not try. And let's leave our keiki and our mo'opuna in a better position that we're in. Let's get a little bit closer for them. So that one day, they can finish it off. So mahalo nui ya okua pao, ke ya hui ana, ke ya akua kua ana. Ku kia imauna kako, ahiki ke aloha aina hope loa. Mahalo.
On October 23rd, Havane and um, Antipoa Case will be here in Kapolei from 3 to 5 o'clock. And so we'll, we'll get that out. Um, I, I think that event can fit 90 people. Lei, Lei Lani Willing, is, um, that one is in partnership with uh, Vai Vai Collective. And it will be held at Moani Restaurant right here in Kamakana Lee. So again, that's Wednesday, October 23rd. Uh, Havane, uh, Rios, and Antipoa Case will be here. Um, and that will be 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And so you can um, visit Kavaivai Collective, um, their website, it'll be on that. Ulua A Learning Center. Kanao Kana will probably blast that out as well. Um, but also, if we have your email address, we'll send that information out to you. October 23rd. Mahalo. Aloha, everyone. Just one more announcement. You're all welcome to join our Kia'i here in Kapolei Monday through Friday from 4 to 6 outside in the main road until the last. Aloha Aina. Mahalo.